It's where our licensing goes. Communications manner is, is the centerpiece of everything we do. Everything we do. And again, in the voice world, this is pretty much important and everything. Yes, sir. So does Cups work in connection with Jabber? Because I know when I call it Jabber, it shows the Yes. So Jabber, Jabber was the... What, uh, Jabber. Yeah. <coughs> Say that again. Say that. What is Jabber? What is Jabber? I'm waiting for that. I was waiting for that. I, you know, there's certain questions. There's certain questions that will come up every time, and I love it. I'm just waiting on it. I was about to say, in this class, I usually hear. Uh, what is Jabber? So Jabber is actually a series of things, and let's go through them. Jabber was once a company, a company that built a protocol, a proprietary protocol, not, not a standard protocol, that was easier for I am and presence than the traditional protocol that we used of SIP, SIP Simple was what we had used for the first iteration of I am in presence. SIP simple is not efficient. I'll just say that. This company called Jabber created a separate protocol that was much more slick, much easier to use, required a thinner client. The client didn't have to do as much work. It was easier to use on a network. So it was a company and it was a protocol. It was a company that Cisco acquired in 2008. <laughs> Cisco acquired the company Jabber in 2008. And, that, and the protocol that they wrote that we called Jabber became a standard. XMPP is the standard uh, 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 protocol to use for uh, I am in presence today. The premier protocol for that. Jabber is now a series of clients that Cisco uses for its communications on, on your, all your devices. So if you have it, you want a soft phone client that gives you IM presence and video capabilities, it's called Jabber for Windows, because you're using Windows. Okay. If you would like one, it's called Jabber for Mac. If you have an iPhone, it's called Jabber for iPhone. If you want for uh, Jabber for iPad, Jabber for Android. So Jabber is really our mobility, our client for all communications, the base, and it's a, it's a fleet of clients based on the operating system you do or what device you're putting it on. It's, it, does, it gets complicated, but if you just think about it that way, Jabber is, a Siri, is a, our product line based on your operating system or what device you're going to put it on that gives you capabilities for phone, Voice messaging, presence, the whole nine yards, and video. Now, is it there yet with all of them? No. Like on my Mac, I have Jabber for Mac here, and it gives me great phone service. I am in presence. I can get my voicemail. It doesn't have video on it yet. It's coming out just in the next month or two. But we have another client for that. And I can get high-definition high Great telepresence on this Mac. You would not believe how good it looks. It looks as good as one of those CTSs on this Mac with that client. Now, what they're doing is they're rolling that capability inside the Jabber. So the next version of Jabber is going to have that. Yes, sir. So you have to have anything to use Jabber? You'd have to have the, the what? Uh, uh, any connect. On the, outside, on the outside, yes. On the inside, no. No. When you download Jabber, the first thing it says on it is it's required with the communications manager. Right. Yeah. So what it says. I, I don't think anybody can log in and get their own free Jabber account. Yeah. Well, there's Jabber video, right? You're talking about Jabber video? I, I know. Like, for instance, when, when I interviewed with Cisco, my first one was over Jabber. They sent me a free link. And yeah, but it's Jabber it. video, right? It was a video? Yeah. It was video. Yeah, it was video. But this is different. Jabber video, if you, uh, I've got that on here too because I use it with my wife. That's, yeah. that, that, that's like Skype. Yeah. That's Cisco's version of Skype out there. But Jabber the clients right. have to have the server because they're a client to our server. Right? They're a client to the server. Now, you know, it's, it's like people say, well, Skype is client to client. Like hell, it's not. 
How do you, Skype is, is set up the exact same way as this, so those link. You gotta figure out where they're at. <laughs> does, does your client automatically know the IP address of everybody out there? No, they have to log in. What happens when you try to Skype me and I'm not logged in? Doesn't work, because what? I have to log into a server. All this is client server. So what happens with this is if I have an iPhone here, and I log in and I put Jabber up here and any connect comes to me there and I want to talk to this person here. Well, guess what? We're talking. This client is registering with this server. This client is registering with that server. And they're saying, I'd like to talk to that person. He's saying, you talk to him. If I want to talk to somebody on an iPad over here and they have any connect and Jabber here, it's a secure tunnel back in. I'm registering with communications manager. I say I want to call them, communications manager sets up a tunnel back, it goes like this. And yes, it goes back to our headquarters. It goes back to our headquarters. Does that make sense? Jabber is our clients, and, and I'm telling you, are we there yet? No, but guess what? Link's not everywhere either. Does Link work for Android? Does Link work for Mac? I mean, is it always going to be? No. So nobody's got the perfect client. Nobody does. Nobody has the perfect client. You may be coming to this bit, but yeah. what I found a little bit confusing in my first couple of weeks is hmm. why do I use WebEx sometimes? Why do I use WebEx? Oh sometimes? boy. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> some people are using Java, some are using WebEx. So I've got presence here, but it's WebEx, it's not Java. Right, because when Cisco when Cisco first acquired uh, WebEx, and might as well get into that. Where's WebEx at? On this diagram, where's WebEx? Oh, it's in the, somebody say it loud. The cloud. We acquired a cloud company. Now, by the way, you can now sell WebEx. They're going to start selling WebEx as a on-prem for meetings only, for meetings only. But they're actually going to sell it on-prem for customers. So you'll have that opportunity, which is kind of cool for some customers who want to, don't want to go out to the cloud for stuff. They have super secrets or whatever. But WebEx is out here, and WebEx is a series of products. It's not just one, it's a series of products. What are some of the features and things we can do with WebEx? What are some? All right, so we got meetings, and we can share desktops. All right? We can do chatting with the chat. We can do chat also. Oh, chat, exactly. Inside of that, guess what? It's client server, and they've added presence in it. Presence in it. They've added video now. We actually can offer this as a video solution. You can record this. Uh, let me just say, uh, there's some centers. So let's say WebEx centers. You have Meeting Center, which is what most people do. Gives you a shared audio bridge. You can have video bridge and talk, see each other and all this, that, and the other. You can, you know, share documents, control documents and all that. Pass the ball, right? Who hasn't passed the ball, right? But Training Center. What's the difference between Training Center and Meeting Center? Yeah. First of all, I yes, I can do everything in training center that I could do in this classroom, right? I really can. I could put you in small groups. I can put people in small groups. I can test you. I can do pre-work, pre-test. I could uh, uh, give you, uh, put you in little groups, jump into the little groups and talk to you, and then jump back out and put us in a big group. I can do a post-test. I can do all kinds of things in Training Center. It's a very powerful tool. It really is. It really is. Uh, what else do we have there? How about Support Center? You can actually have a help desk there. Support Center. They can actually take control of laptops and do things like that. Quick way to roll out a support desk if you have to. If you, you know, instead of going and getting a call center thing. You can actually interface this with your call center and let people use this as the place where everybody goes to, for support. 
Uh, how about event center? Event center. What would that be for? What if I have a new pro product I'm rolling out and I want everybody to see it worldwide? I want 5,000 people to come. I, what kind of facility am I going to lease? And am I going to fly everybody there? Probably not. I might bring as many people as I can to one facility, but guess what? They could join us on Event Center. I can market to them. I can get their, have them log in, get their name. I can track it. I could actually even see if they, at the end of it, see if they're happy with it, what their feedback was for our marketing organization. So, yeah, WebEx is huge. Excuse me? But like meeting center or anything? Uh, tr uh, event center scales virtually unlimited. Meeting center, you, when you buy a meeting center, you only get so many. Uh, there's a lot of uh, tracking of this that you can do. Training center is kind of cool too because if you're in a training session and you're looking at your WebEx and then you go off to another page, they can actually tell. And they can get a report on how much percent of the time you're actually looking at WebEx and how much you were doing your email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yes, yes. You could actually take, you could actually take WebEx up here and use that as I am in presence. There I am in presence, and it's called federation, and federate that back to yours. So everything that happens up here will be shown up here. That's what we do here at Cisco. We actually federate the two. Federate the two. But you don't have to. You can just use this. But that means everybody has to log in here, even when they're back here. So you could do either way. For us as uh, Cisco employees, you can also manage deals, right? Using yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, deal managers, isn't that in Salesforce? Mm -hmm. That's in Salesforce, I think, yeah, isn't it? Salesforce. Well, they're actually starting to, you know, the big thing about, uh, you know, we had this, you buy, used to buy a bunch of client server applications behind your firewall and you started integrating them. We called it SOA, right? Service Oriented Architecture. Guess what? Now with the cloud, what do you think is going to be the cloud? If I have WebEx out here and I have Salesforce.com out here, don't you think you might want to start doing that? Absolutely. That's the next wave, this cloud to cloud, right? The cloud, I'll have WebEx cloud working with Salesforce cloud. That, and again, that, that's where services better come in. Boy, that just blows my top of my head off. But that's eventually what's going to happen. It's eventually what's going to happen. I see what they're doing now with Jabber is they're integrating it with SAP. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Putting Jabber SDK into SAP CRM. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can actually use it. Yep. You know, the, uh, we're also putting Jabber SDKs out there so you can actually integrate it into SAP too. Does this make sense so far? There's a lot of products and a lot of stuff here, folks. A lot of products and a lot of stuff. The limitation for this stuff, probably in between your ears, it's just finding the right parts and pieces. There's more applications in this section than any other place in Cisco. We just keep doing applications, applications, applications. But does this make sense so far? These are just, these are server applications, virtualized server applications. So will Jabber and WebEx like kind of be combined at some later point? Uh, because they kind of do similar Well, Jabber, Jabber is, we still want to be able to sell it back here behind the firewall and we can do that federation so a customer could have it here and use it there as well and, and it work. And it work. Yeah. So, uh, it's already Jabber, really, out here. It's already the, the, the presence is out here. So you could, you could point your Jabber client to that. That's what we do. I can do it. I can sign in in two different places in Cisco. I can sign in back here for this presence server. I can sign in as Jabber using my uh, WebEx ID. I have two places I can log in and change my client. Use the same client on different servers. I can because I'm on ACE, the, the collaboration team, this high-end thing, so I can do that. But, but to me, that's cumbersome. Like, why? Like, well, uh, because ACE is a separate network that gives me a little bit extra. We don't give for everybody else. 
but uh, depending on what I want to do. Ace is kind of like the next generation. Ace is, Ace, is, Ace is all the things we're selling to customers that we don't use behind Cisco's firewall. Because we're selling, we're selling technologies that we don't even use ourselves if you're not on Ace. And that's bad. We should be using it over and over and over. Everybody should be using everything. But we have an Ace program that uh, you have to be sponsored for. But you all should be on Ace being able to show all this stuff. But uh, so uh, quickly, quickly, I want to now talk about all of this stuff in relationship. And I got a messy draw drawing here. I want to go back to this. You got communications manager, switch, router, uh, PC with Jabber. Uh, IP phone. So Cisco acquired this company called Tanberg. Tanberg was a video company. Cisco had been trying to do video for a long time. Matter of fact, in the late 90s, some of us may remember Avid, the architecture for voice video and integrated data. Cisco had. Well, I saw, sold a lot of voice, but I didn't sell a lot of video. I was kind of scared of video. I knew what, what it would do to my networks, and I was just trying to get voice out there. But guess what? Tamberg made very successful, you know, very successful selling video, and now video is really matured, and it's a, uh, everybody expects it today. So again, how does that integrate into our solution? Again, Communications manager is set up and control, call set up and control. So if you have a video device, somebody name me one of our video devices. Our, what's our biggest one called? The big three screen. Telepresence, Telepresence 9000, the TX9000, the big one, right? So with video, we have immersive, right? Immersive is the heavy duty, the TX9000. The CTS 3000s, all those three screen rooms that you engineer and all that, costs a lot of money, you have to have services for it, so you service people should be happy, and all that. That's a video endpoint here. And it has a device inside of it. The screens are, look good, but the smarts of it are called a codec, a coder decoder. And that's what registers with communications manager. So your voice endpoints, your phone's registered with communications manager, now your video endpoints are registering with communications manager. How about uh, the business class? The business video, the MX uh, 200, 300. Those single screens that you can set up really easy and put it in rooms. Have you seen those? You've seen the MXs? Yeah, really nice. Guess what? They have, they sit here, they're single screens, they have a codec. And it registers with communications manager. Uh, what about your personal, the, uh, what is it, the little 60s and 90s? Well, the EX for everyone, the EX series, the 60 or the 90, really cute screens, 21 or 24 inch screens. Guess what they have inside of them? A codec, and it registers with Communications Manager. So we've moved all these video devices to register with Communications Manager as well. So when I, now, telepresence is sometimes a lot different than, you know, we can go in here and make a call from here to here if we want to, but when we do meetings, how do we set up a meeting? How do we set up a meeting? Through Outlook. through Outlook, through mail, right? Through your schedule and everything, right? So let me, let's, let's go through a meeting. I'm going to have a meeting with uh, all three of us. We're going to have a meeting. Now, first, I have to have a meeting with you first to talk about how we're going to talk to him because he's important. We have to make sure that we know what to say. So I have mail out here and my scheduling in Outlook, right? So who do I invite? If I'm going to be, 
I'm going to be at my desk and we're going to use this MX200 for you and you're so important we're going to give you this three screen, right? So here's what we're going to do. So the, for the first meeting it's just going to be me and you. So what do I do? I go to my Outlook and who do I invite? I own my schedule and then I invite you. So I have me, yeah, and who else do I have to invite? The, the room, the conference room, the room. Who owns its schedule? You own your schedule. You're, you, know, you decide if you, you come. Who owns the schedule for the room? Ah. Well, there's a schedule in here. What if we had an application to do that? Tamberg did. Tamberg has an application called TMS, Telepresence Management Suite. And it owns the rooms and the schedule for the equipment. It owns their schedule. So when I send that email, that request out, and it goes into the box, the schedule box for this, TMS answers that. It keeps up and tracks the schedule for all your rooms and all your equipment. It does that. TMS does. Yeah. So it says yes, it can. So it pops back and we can have our meeting. When we walk in there, when you walk in, the, in that meeting, it actually say in there, on the, the little pad that's sitting there, here's your meeting. How's it do that? TMS says, hey, the meeting is going to happen. Communications manager, will you put this schedule on here? You walk in, you see your schedule, Eddie's meeting. You walk in, you push that button. When you push that button, it tells communications manager, I want to activate that meeting. He looks at TMS and says, what meeting are you talking about? What endpoints do you want me to set up? He says, I want you to set this endpoint up with this endpoint. Good, I'll do it. Ah, if it's already booked, what comes back? Sorry, I can't have the meeting. TMS will look at its schedule. If you've already taken that room, then guess what? It comes back and says, can't have the meeting. Is it possible to see the schedule? Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't show you the schedule. Yeah, it'll show you the schedule. It'll say, hey, here's the schedule. Here's the things you can have. And you have, uh, I actually saw this. Uh, yeah. We have Oregon Pipe and Sawara. So yeah. We have numerous rooms, and you can go through and see which ones are available. It's actually yeah. really cool. Yeah. So the entire database of the room lies in the TMS, is it? Excuse me? The entire database of all the rooms. Let's say the office will have about 10 functions. It's all in the schedule. You just create a schedule for it. No, but the database lies where? It, right here. Right here, TMS, TMS. Your your question, sir. Your question. I was going to ask. Um, will TMS? I know this is native in Exchange, right? The scheduling. Yeah. So does it? Will TMS work on notes? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it'll work with Exchange or notes. Absolutely. It'll work with Google, by the way, too. Does that come automatically when you buy our video stuff, or is that like an? TMS is an additional application to manage the solutions. To manage the solutions. Yes, you buy that. It's a software application, a virtualized server. Uh, telepresence manu management suite. Telepresence management suite. That's how that works. So anytime you choose a room or anything, TMS is the guy that says, hey, yes or no. He, he answers for the room. He owns the room schedule. Yes, sir. For the meeting rooms. Yes. No, no. He won't even do the meeting rooms because he doesn't care. He's just worried about the time. Because when you put that, that MX in there, you tell him you've got an MX200 in there. How many screens on that and all that? He, has to, he doesn't care about a regular meeting room. That's just something else. The regular rooms, if you can actually book it through your Outlook, mm -hmm. it's actually being managed by exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the reason I asked for the Lotus Notes question is because when, when you told me about TMS, mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking at the back of my mind, Microsoft can do uh, meeting room bookings, right? Mm -hmm. And if the meeting room is on, uh, is booked, uh -huh. there's just an auto reply that says yeah. the meeting room is booked. So yeah. it auto declines. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's the same with here. Yeah. If you're booking a regular conference room with no telepresence, it's actually just running through it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have our meeting. We have our meeting. And now we're going to have our second meeting. So we've got to go to our boss. We've got to be sharp. We've talked about what we're going to do. Now we're going to have a meeting between 
three people and two rooms. One of the rooms is up here, a room over here, and three people, because I own my personal schedule, I own that, and three people. So I send you a request and say, hey, listen, I'd like to have a meeting here, and I'm going to reserve this room. TMS. Now, now TMS has a problem. TMS needs, what else do we need now? We, point to point, if, I, if we're just meeting here, it's just this talking to this. But if we're having three people connect up, what do you have to have? You have to have a bridge. A bridge. You have to have a video bridge. A video bridge. Part of our infrastructure, another part of our infrastructure. We bring that in. And what's that bridge called? It's called an MCU. A multi-point conference unit. Multi-point multi conference unit. And what it does is it allows, a, it creates video bridges based on the number of screens you have and the capabilities you have. Who do you think manages MCUs? TMS. TMS manages it initially. Yeah, TMS. MCU is hardware. MCU is hardware. An MCU can be software and servers at a, for a smaller scale, but usually it's a lot of DSPs. These things are expensive. If you get to sell MCUs, it's going to help your quota relief, I promise you. These things are seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a piece. And this is not a Tamburg product? This is, this is a former Tamburg product. This is, yes. Yes, falls under the video and what Tamburg brought us, the MCUs. We'll look at the products a little bit later. Does this make sense so far? Make sense? So if we want to have multi-points, right, which is not point to point, we have to have an MCU. Now, what, t when you send that email out, TMS automatically says, wait, there's three devices going to be talking here. Let me find my MCU. You might, get, you might know this room is available, but I might not have an MCU resource available. And the, TMS will say, sorry, can't have the meeting. Yeah, TMS manages that initially. Initially, it won't manage that. Well, so, huh? I guess I'm a little confused. Why would TMS <coughs> devices supposed to copy the same set of packets that you're sending with a different IP address and oh. then transmit them? Why would you want? No, 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 no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Copy the exact same packets. Well, no. I mean, you're digitizing the video packets and the audio packets, you're sending mm -hmm. them over, and you're making a connection from one to one. Why wouldn't you send that same identical packet with a different destination address to another video? Is because all right, I have three people sitting at this screen. Which one do I send here? If it was one to one, <laughs> it would if, 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 no, it's not. I'm just you, yeah, yeah. You need some. How, we follow voice, right? So at these tables, when you go to the three screen, you notice you have three microphones there and three cameras on there. I've only got one screen here and one screen here. Okay. So let me re-ask my question. Yes. If that was a single screen device. Mm-hmm. And you have three people on this, each on their own single screen device. Mm -hmm. Do you need the MCU? Yes. Yes, you'll need an MCU. Because you want to follow who's talking. You want to follow who's talking. And the MCU is the only thing that can change change the direction of that. Trust me. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, the MCU, because I heard from our TP guys, right? Uh -huh. The TP sessions would um, would adjust to the lowest bandwidth speed, right? All right. So, so is that controlled by the MCU? The MCU, the capability of the MCU. So let's say that. All of us have high definition. We don't have to worry about it. We're all going to be doing 1080p at 60 frames or 30 frames, however frames we're doing. It's all going to be great. But let's say that I'm using something that will only do standard definition. Then the MCU that I choose, and again, TMS will know about this. He will say, oh, you're high def, you're high def, but Eddie's screen is standard definition. I need an MCU that not only can do the bridging, but can do something called transcoding. So we'll have high definition coming in from here, high definition coming in from here, 
and they'll have to convert that in the box to standard definition for if I'm using a standard definition. And TMS will do all this for you. He knows all the different devices and their capabilities, and he'll do that for you. It's called transcoding, and it's very difficult. What's that? What's the question? No, th th I was saying that's probably one of the reasons why we need an, an MCU, the difference on, on, the, on, on the devices. And all right, so, so you, you're saying you, needed a, you need this, what, you want this guy to send it to all these different IP endpoints? And I think that he, no, no, no. he was just mentioning that's oh. probably also one of the reasons why we need an MCU. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For for well, it's, it's also about the number of screens you have, and there's a, there's a lot of different things. Because see, on this three screen, if I just send you who's talking, just multicast who's talking, you're only going to see one person here, right? But in real life, what do you do? You see me on one screen and somebody else on another screen. You actually get to use those. MCUs do that. MCUs do that. It'll upscale, it will try to upscale as high as it can for everything. Standard definition to near high definition. That's what the MCUs do. And folks, let me tell you, these MCUs ain't cheap. They're not cheap at all. Huh? 80,000 plus? Yeah. 40, 50, 60, 80,000. All right, it's based on the number of screens. So an MCU, you'll buy, a, like they'll say, it can support 48 high definition screens. 48 high definition screens means I could have 24, or, or let's say I could have 16 three screen sessions going on, or one, uh, uh, and it's based on screens, so whatever you have here. So in this case, I need one, two, three, four, five screens out of that MCU for this one meeting. And again, based on how much high definition and how much standard definition, video quality. So if you have 500 users, for example, and you have, uh, let's say, 50 or 100 with the video phone capability. Mm-hmm. And uh, plus other users, they are using Java or uh, iPhone and mm -hmm. iPad. And maybe they are yeah. Oh, so how many MCUs might you need? I don't know. A lot. A lot. Them. Huh? You can cluster MCUs. You can cluster MCUs. You can buy them and cluster them. How do you know you're using them all? TMS will actually give you a report about how much you're actually using these and all that to see if you're getting your investment, right? Seeing how much your utilization is. Once you start adding those, you'll all of a sudden see, man, I'm maxing this guy out an awful lot. Oh, you're saying for the MCU? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. It's based on the number of screens. Like, like yeah. The, the maximum for, it depends on the device. We smell, sell small ones that will only do, I think, 24. But you can add on to those. We have large ones that, that, that do 188 screens at one time. And it's, and it's, and you can not, that's not, I'm not saying you have one video call with 188. I'm saying you have a combination of any calls and, the, but the number of screens cannot exceed 188. I mean, does that make sense? Does that make sense? It, it, the MCUs are based on the screen and the quality of, of the, uh, that you want standard definition versus high definition. Like an MCU that does 48 high definitions might do 72 or 96. Standard definitions. So, you have to base it on that. But MCUs, MCUs are really important. The matter of fact, that brings up a great point. If we make video as easy as a phone call, don't you think we're going to need a lot of MCUs? We're going to have MCUs everywhere. Think about every office you'll have to have an MCU, all this, that, and the other. You know what? TMS is really good at keeping up with schedules and a small number of MCUs. But if we have a whole bunch of MCUs, we need to give him an assistant, an administrative assistant. Well, we'll give him a, a software application called Conductor. Conductor is an application that can be virtualized that actually on large scale deployments for video will manage the MCU infrastructure. It will manage the MCU infrastructure. So it's a separate application that we've came up with. 
It also is going to be used for some really cool stuff for policy enforcement on video calls, being able to identify specific needs, i.e. encryption maybe for certain people who are making video calls, things like that in the future. It, it, it enforces, pos enforces policies, saying, guess what, all of a sudden, if I've got my CFO who has a meeting with my CEO and everything, guess what, the policy might be, I not only need MCU, uh, an MCU or a connection, I need something that's going to encrypt it. I need to make sure it's encrypted. And if I can't have it with encryption, I can't have the meeting because it's that important. Yes? What if you're sharing a uh, PowerPoint slide with, in, within this uh, video call? Mm -hmm. that, does that happen? There's a data stream in there. There's it does happen at the MCU. Yes, there's a there's video. These streams that come out of here, there's video, and then there's a whole channel called a video channel for that. There's a whole I, channel I've for that. I've noticed. I've used this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've noticed there are separate screens for power sharing. Power well, it depends on how you want to do it. You could put it anywhere you wanted to. You could put it on the roof, on the ceiling, whatever. But there's in this codec. There's a different, there's a place where it's a whole channel in the flow of the signal that's for, for nothing but presentation, yeah, of that. This is, it's really complicated, but I'll be honest with you, if you, once you see communications manager that's called setup and control, this is about the same thing. It's about the same thing. It's clients, think about it, you don't think about these three screen terminal, but that's a client. That MX is a client. Those are all clients that register with communications manager and are managed by TMS with their schedule. That's all it is. If you think client server in this space, you will be very successful in understanding it, much more successful than if you try to complicate it and stuff. Really, it's client servers, all this stuff is. It's just client server. The phones are clients, the video devices are clients. The server's communications manager, it's called setup and control. It says, oh, you want to call that person? There they are, go do it. Tell me when you're done. I'll manage it, I'll just be your reference guide here. Here's their capabilities, they can do this, they can do that. And go on. Does this make, oh, sorry. Does this make sense for folks? Now the one other thing that I want to talk to you about is all of this infrastructure that we're putting behind a firewall for a customer. What if this customer said, on, that's a lot. I don't know if I want to own this. I don't know if I want to own this. Do we have an answer for them? Absolutely. It's out on the internet, and what's it called? HCS. What's the difference in the products that we're placing back here and the products that go in here? Nothing. There's one extra product. It's a management tool. That's it. HCS is actually proof, and I tell this to my customers when they talk about some of this stuff. I say, you know what? HCS is actually proof that that Cisco architecture works because we've got par partners, non-traditional partners for voice who are actually providing voice services for customers that they never could have done before without this architecture. What did they invest in? They invested in UCS so they'd have an environment so they could have a whole bunch of virtual servers. That's what they did. And then what they do? They're loading all these applications on them. That's what they're doing. What is HCS for? HCS, Hosted Collaboration Services. HCS. You can host your voice. Yes, sir. So how, how widely adopted in, in the U.S. as an example is HCS? Uh, you know, it's still on its early stages, but we're seeing wins. There's, there's probably two or three major wins uh, every month. Yeah. Bi pretty good sized wins. To service providers. To, to service providers. And again, non-traditional service providers. They're not the AT&T's and Verizon's. Now, they're winning some, but they're non-traditional. Die Data, the people like that are doing this. Yeah. yeah. So it's opening up the door. They're opening up the door. Huh? AT&T and Verizon are doing it here. Absolutely. Yeah. But yes, yes, and again, for us it's really good because what's the what's the account manager get? You get 
Like if they sell a three-year subscription, three years for how many ever, you get 100% of the first year, 50% of the second year, and 30% of the third year. Wow, that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. But HCS is proof that it works. Now we can, again, you can have dial tone, you can have voice messaging, you can now integrate that with video. You can also do contact center. Now we can do contact center back here. Or we can do it out here. Now contact center, is that important to a customer? Contact center? Why is it important to a customer? Yeah, yeah. If you want to give customer support. What if you want to just have the customer give you, give you their credit card? That'd be nice. It's directly related to revenue. I'm either giving customer service for somebody who's bought from me, so you get them to buy more. I'm either saying, oh, you bought that, I want you to be a happy customer, so you'll buy more, or I'm actually taking your money. <laughs> about one of the three is about it. Yeah. Application, exactly. We have two, I'm going to just cover two types of contact center. We have contact center express, which is in essence an application server, one or two, that, that we could use for up to 450 agents. For up to 450 agents. Or we have contact center enterprise, which scales to, I think, it's well over 7,000 agents. It's a lot more complicated. It's several servers. Contact Center Enterprise. Now, who, who do you talk to about Contact Center? Do you walk into IT? No, never. Never, never. Never. Ne thank you. Never. That's the worst place to go. That's the worst place to go. You'll get all the information you'll ever need there. <laughs> uh, you have to go to the business unit. You have to go in there and talk to them about how they're... And now, what are some of the... Uh, who's number one in contact center worldwide? Avaya. Hmm? Avaya. Avaya. Avaya is. And again, Avaya uh, was number one before, and then they got Nortel's share of the pie, and they became even bigger number ones and all that. But uh, is there anything interesting going on with the traditional Avaya customers in the next year or so about the platforms that Avaya is moving to? Mm. Yeah, Avaya had their own separate way of doing things, right? And it was good. I'm, I'm telling you, it was great. I really liked it. Snapped onto that big PBX, and it worked really well. Nortel had their own version of this, which was called Symposium. And again, totally different. It's like in the U.S., you either like Fords or Chevrolets. You don't like it. You can't like both. You can't like both. And guess what? All these traditional Avaya people have been given some really, really, really bad news. This is going away and they'll have to go to a symposium. Does that give us an interesting opportunity to go into accounts and find out? Oh, yeah. Guess what? You have a choice. And maybe you want to look at Cisco now. Might be something you can do. Again, their reports are going to change and all this. I mean, their whole way of doing. And again, Avaya people have disliked Nortel. Nortel for a lot longer than they dislike Cisco. It's a long standing. So they, if they're going to have to have a change, why not change to maybe the Cisco? And again, what are some of the drivers, new drivers in video, uh, in, uh, I just gave you the answer, in contact center? Video. video. Yeah. Customers, are, they're doing it now. My customers are, they're, I've got to do that. I'm taking my top 20% and I'm, I'm going to start with the, the 15 to 20 percent people, and I'm going to start doing video for them. I'm going to work it out great and roll it out for the top 15 percent, not let them see the bad things that we have to go through. And then I'm going to go. I'm going to run that. That's going to give me better reach, better collaboration with them. So you could advise them. <coughs> in no, Avaya has actually acquired a company called Radvision, who used to be a partner with Microsoft, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but they've acquired a company called Radvision. So that's who they would use. And again, 
But do they have the networking resources for it? Do they have the the the, pack, the capabilities? To do it? I don't think they do. They, they used to sell life size and polygons. Mm -hmm. I saw some huge yeah. deals, mostly mm -hmm. uh, in Canada. With mm -hmm. the CBC as an example. Yeah. They yeah. They sold polygons with mm -hmm. their solution because yeah. Red, Vision Red Vision just couldn't support it. It's not that tight with the via. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, there's, uh, I really think that's some place you can go in. You have to be able to have a specific conversation about customer service and process and, and this, that, and the other. Uh, there are specialists out there. If you do not, you know, you can go in and muck this thing up really quick. You need to find somebody who knows how to talk to contact center people. Because you... This is, this is, you know, we talk about layer 8, 9, and 10. This is layer 10. This is a religion. This is as deep a religion as you'll ever find, contact center is. They don't like change. They hate change. They want the same reports, the same this, that, and the other. The problem is, is the industry's changing and everything, and they're going to have to change in some way. If we can identify the change and help them with the change and, and, and introduce risk about using somebody else, maybe if you're doing video and this, that, and the other, what are we in video? Are we like rank number two? We're number three? Number four? No, we're number one. The, ne the network's going to have to be in place. We have the capabilities of doing this probably better than anybody. So we need to be able to l leverage that inside of these uh, discussions if, if it gets brought up, for sure. By the way, contact center could be part of a host of collaboration solution. Why would that be important to a customer? Huh, upgrades. Just think about this. Am I going to have to live through this upgrade thing? No, <laughs> right? No. Actually, another reason is because um, there are a lot of people who want to enter the contact center industry, but uh -huh. they don't want to spend on, uh, it's a barrier to investment. Absolutely. Yeah, barrier to entry is the investment and the expertise to do it. What if I want to outsource this? What if I just want to outsource this? Cisco, actually, our partners out there on the outside actually have a uh, contact center hosted. We have partners who will host contact center. Who will host contact center. It's enterprise and a hosted solution. And they will do it. Great point. Great point. I might need a thousand users. Think about it. Seasonal business. H&R Block, people who do taxes here in the U.S., right? And uh, at, at the end of January, everybody needs help and everything. And then guess what? After April 15th, you're supposed to have it done, supposed to. And then you don't need those people. So up and down, scaling it. What if I want to say I want diversity? I, I work in New Jersey. That's where my offices are at. And if I did it on my site, I would be right on that New Jersey coast. Wow, that's not good, because what, what happened to New Jersey? Sandy came in and just cleaned it out. My contact center would be gone. If I had a hosted solution, I could say, hey, listen, am I still going to be able to, can I take all my employees, drive them 75 miles inland, put them up somewhere, and be able to connect up to a hosted solution and still get my contact center? Yes, for redundancy and resiliency in a hosted environment. So that, that might be something that, that's really important today. So, so collaboration is kind of cool, isn't it? A lot of stuff. There's more parts and applications here than, and I, just, I didn't go through all of it. I'm just trying to give you a kind of a broad overview of it. That's what this class is really about. But we have got a significant investment here, and I'm telling you, we're really good at this stuff. We're really good. But here's the problem. And I said this back in 2001 when I worked for Cisco, so I'm going to say it again. Cisco can complicate an anvil. Does everybody know what an anvil is? <laughs> an anvil. Just a big piece of metal that you used to put horseshoes on and everything. Cisco can complicate that. We have to make this simple for our customers. We have to simplify. And you know how the best way to do it is don't even talk about it. Talk about their business. The products, will come, the products will come along. But if you talk about their business and everything, you're not trying to simplify this. You're trying to actually fix something for them. And at the end of the day, when they 
we say, well, we have a solution that'll do this and this and this. Yeah, and eventually in a bill of materials, this stuff will all roll out. But you've got to get that bit, them to agree to it first. Absolutely. Because this, the bill of materials for a solution like this is you wouldn't believe how many pages it is. It's more than I even care. We kill way too many trees with that, even electronic trees. It's one of the biggest complaints Tamburg people had. Bill of materials for Tamburg was like one page. They come to Cisco, and it's six. Same, same solution. So, not saying it's easy. But we have to simplify this. The best thing to do is talk to your customer about how they want to communicate. Ask, to, ask them how, the, how it's changed in the past and how it's going to change in the future. How are they going to handle Emily? How are they going to handle all these different, different factors that are coming in? And what's their strategy in doing that? And who best to help them with that? Because guess what? Cisco's got a long and successful history of addressing this. Because we were on the forefront of it, and we've continued to do this. From IP telephony to unified communications to collaboration, adding video, mobility, the strategy around that and everything. And guess what? The infrastructures came along and been able to support the whole thing. Support the whole thing. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. We have WebEx meetings where we can have multiple videos of people all on the screen simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Is an equivalent type of MCU required? It's up in it's up in WebEx. It's all in WebEx. It's all being done in software in WebEx. In, in hardware, hardware in WebEx. WebEx. Yeah, okay. yeah. WebEx has got. If, if you ever get a chance, the WebEx underground node, one of their underground nodes, is right up here somewhere. I've always wanted to go. It was actually designed as a disaster bunker for the PSTN for one of the big class five switches here. 